Well, good evening. Good to see everybody tonight. You have a Bible tonight. I want you to go in the book of Psalms with me, if you will. We're going to the 116th division in the Psalms, and we're going to spend all of our time right there tonight in Psalm 116. And while you're getting settled, we welcome all of you. Thanks for being with us on this very beautiful Sunday afternoon. What a beautiful day we've enjoyed together and glad that we can be together tonight. And thank all of you for being here. We have a lot of folks visiting with us tonight. That's always the case, but particularly so on a week like this when it is a holiday week. We've got lots of folks who are traveling to be with us. We have a lot of our folks who've already taken off and are out of town and more that will be leaving through the course of the week. It's kind of uh, um, uh, coming and going that way. <clears throat> and it seems to all work out just, just fine. But uh, if you're visiting with us tonight, welcome. We are so happy that you've, you've come our way. We've got some folks here tonight from places where I've been in gospel meetings out in Texas and a large contingent of folks from up in Fishers, Indiana that are visiting with us where I was just a few weeks ago. And for all of you that are visiting with our church family, we are so happy <clears throat> that, you are, that you are here. I had planned tonight, I was going to take a few minutes and I wanted to introduce some new members to you. We have... Uh, we have several folks over the last several weeks that have, that have identified with our church family. And uh, I don't think, as I've looked coming in, I think they are all already gone for Thanksgiving. And so I was going to introduce Patrick Kelly. I know Patrick's gone. And uh, April and Sadie Smith, I don't, I don't see them anywhere. Are they? Oh, there. Stand up We're, so we can see you. You're in different places. All right, there's one and over here. Oh, right over here. Thank you. I'm sorry. I did I was looking for your blonde hair and didn't see it anywhere. All right, there, in, there, in the back and there, okay. All right, we're doing better than I thought. Stephanie Arias, I don't, Stephanie's not here tonight, is she? And her kids, Jasmine and Jade, I don't think so. All right, Lise, are you here? Lise Limeron? Lise, stand up. All right, there's Lise, all right, <clears throat> all right. I, can't, I wish I could introduce you like I did when you played volleyball. That would be fun. Yeah, that'd be great. And I didn't see Kristen. Kristen Gay, are you here tonight? I didn't see Kristen come in tonight. No, okay. I see her grandpa back there. I guess I could have Jack stand up <clears throat> in her place. But anyway, we've had, we've had so many folks come to us in the last several weeks, and we're, we, we, just, we never, ever take that for granted. And we are so grateful for that. And we'll make sure that you meet these new folks that are with us. I also want to say that <clears throat> this semester we have had so many college students with us, and we have enjoyed our college students immensely. You've just been such a blessing to our church family. We have, we have talked uh, many, many times about what a tremendous group of college students, not only that we have in number, but in quality, just the, the wonderful way that you've gotten involved with us and made yourself a part, and for that we are very, very grateful. I want to say to all of our members that tomorrow or Tuesday you will receive an email that will have a kind of a picture directory of all of our college students so that you can put a name with all of the faces, and there are a lot of them. And so you'll receive that either tomorrow or maybe Tuesday, but that will come to you in an email. And so we want you to, we want you to know about that. And our college students, of course, will all be leaving for Thanksgiving. Some of you will be staying around here with either some family or others, but most will be, will be traveling. And we, we hope you have a tremendous holiday. The semester is almost over for you. When you get back, you turn around twice, and it's, it's over and done. But we have absolutely loved having you with us this year and, and for what you mean to us. Thank you. You know, there's some other things that, uh, that you just might want to be made aware of tonight. I was talking to uh, Joyce Payne's daughters this morning as they came in, and today would have been Joyce's 80th birthday. And what wonderful memories we have of Joyce. We, you know, this year and last year, <clears throat> we've lost some true matriarchs in our congregation, just wonderful ladies who made a difference for good for decades and decades, and Joyce was certainly, certainly one of them. And then I just wanted to say that in the family report this morning, there was a note about Karen Hudson, and Karen's been diagnosed with a malignancy, and that is going to be treated with oral chemotherapy, and we're grateful for that, that she doesn't have to have the infusions, and it's been found early, and so it's really thought that she's going to make a full recovery. And we are very, very thankful and grateful for that. But we want you to pray for Karen. We want you to pray that that will be exactly that way. And we want you to pray for Pat, <clears throat> because Pat has had such a difficult time as she's received her treatment. And we're praying for healing for her, but the treatment that she's received has been so extremely challenging for her. And so we want to remember to pray for her as well. And you know, one of the things that happens <clears throat> during this 
during this holiday and then during the Christmas holiday is that we get a lot of the young people that grew up in our church family and, and, uh, and moved away uh, who come back to visit. And so like Alan this morning led singing for us. And wasn't it great to hear Alan lead singing with us this morning? It's wonderful to have him back with us and he and, and his good family. And um, Rachel Keenan is here tonight. And we will have, we'll have others through this week, particularly Wednesday night. We'll have a lot of those young people that come back. And that, man, that is just always so very, very special. Now, Rachel came back, and she's sporting some new jewelry on her left hand. She has a beautiful engagement ring there. And her fiancé is going to be here Wednesday night. So you interrogate him 40 ways to Sunday. <clears throat> See if he's going to be worthy of our Rachel. All right. It is so good to have all of you here tonight. I, I want to just give you a real quick update about Vicki tonight. I'm happy to tell you that Vicki came home yesterday. And so we're really, really excited about that. And she, she has made just excellent, just excellent improvement over the past several weeks. And so we are very, very thankful for that. You know, the, <clears throat> the, the things that she's been dealing with have been building for for a year or more, and so, you know, that's not, that's not quickly and easily taken care of. But she's made wonderful improvement. She's made excellent progress. She's worked extremely hard with that. I'm very proud of her and, and very thankful for that. You probably won't see her for, for just a few weeks yet as she uh, continues to heal. But the last thing she said to me before I left the house this afternoon was, please tell, please tell, that I love and miss everyone terribly. And thank you for the countless cards and notes and letters and gifts, and especially your prayers. And I can't wait to see you again. It would just be impossible for us to express you know, what your words and what your prayers have, have meant to us over these past few weeks. You know, I've told Vicki that <clears throat> in every service, I don't I don't get any exercise because I can just stand in one place and I'm inundated with people asking about her. And I thank you for that, uh, again, more than I know how to express. And I want to say just a personal word to, uh, to my fellow shepherds in this church and thank them publicly for the way that they have shepherded us and taken care of us. It means more to us than we know how to express. Appreciated Joe's prayer tonight. Last Sunday morning, <clears throat> I thanked Rich for his communion meditation. And I appreciated Matt's this morning as well. And Brad's good song service tonight. But especially Joe's good prayer of thanksgiving tonight. You know, I've talked a lot about the fact that we ask a lot of our God. And I will tell you, I certainly have in the last few weeks. But we need to remember to be people of thanksgiving. And I want to talk about that just a little bit tonight. Do you have a Bible open to Psalm 116? I want not to read the whole chapter to you, but <clears throat> I would like to read a few verses with you. And then we're going to take just a few minutes tonight and dissect two or three things. So let's just read a handful of verses together tonight out of Psalm 116. Listen to what the psalmist said. Listen to the psalmist. I love the Lord because he heard my voice and my supplication. He is inclined his ear to me, and therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. Verse 5, gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low. He saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, because the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. You've delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from falling. And so I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Verse 12, what shall I render the Lord for all his benefits toward me? Well, I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord, and I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all of his people. O Lord, verse 16. O Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. Now, I'm going to ask you to tuck those verses away, and we're going to come back to them because I'm going to tell you the illustration that I want to begin with tonight is about as jarring and in juxtaposition to that as you could ever get. I want to talk to you tonight by way of introduction 
about the 39th president of the United States. The 39th president of the United States was a gentleman named Jimmy Carter. And I realized that Jimmy Carter, when all was said and done, was not a very good president. That's almost universally agreed upon. But it's almost also universally agreed upon that he was a very, has been a very, very good ex-president. He's had more years out of office than any president in American history. And during those four decades that he has been out of the Oval Office, he has devoted himself, dedicated himself to service really to mankind. And so he has worked tirelessly, for example, to ease disease in Africa. He has, he has worked around the world to help solidify democracy in, in, um, in places, nations, where that has been precarious at best, and where he has worked to make sure that elections were free and democratic and fair. And most notably, he is known for his work, not just as a spokesman, but as a hands-on worker with Habitat for Humanity. Now, President Carter is 95 years old. He's 95 years old. And if you've watched the news at all in the last two years, you know that he's battled a great many physical challenges. He had melanoma that spread to his brain and had to be treated for that. He fell and broke a hip and had to have surgery for that. And not very long ago, back in October, he took a tumble and he hit his head and just opened a wide gash over his, over his eye and he had to have about 16 stitches. Well, anybody would have excused him from an obligation that he had scheduled the next day in Nashville, Tennessee, to work on building another house for Habitat for Humanity. And yet the next morning, there he was. And he looked a little worse for the wear. You could see that patch over his eye, and yet there he is, and he's smiling. And again, he's, he's doing hands-on work, and, he's, and he's, 95, he's 95 years old. Now, I don't know about the wisdom of moving in a house built by a 95-year-old, but there's a sentiment here that, that I think is just fairly amazing. You know, the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, that President Carter and his wife Rosalind in their four decades outside of Washington, D.C., have helped build houses for Habitat for Humanity in 14 different countries. And in some way, they have, they've been a part of the construction of about 4,000 different houses over those four decades. President Carter was raised in the little community of Plains, Georgia, but he graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy. He is a nuclear physicist by training. He served on nuclear submarines in the Navy, came back to his native Georgia, made the family farm a profitable enterprise, ran for and was elected governor of Georgia, and again at 95 years of age, he's lived longer than any president in U.S. history. I've got to tell you honestly, if I just were to confess it honestly, I, I have very, very little in common with Mr. Carter politically. Philosophically, we do not agree politically about very much at all. But I'll tell you what I'm impressed with about that man, is that in his years outside of government, he has lived a life of thanks and giving. He lives a life of thanks. It is well chronicled, it's been shown on the news countless times, that former President <clears throat> Carter teaches a Bible class at his, at his church in Plains, Georgia every Sunday. And he still does that every Sunday. And when you listen to him talk, when you listen to him <clears throat> when he is being interviewed and talking, he punctuates whatever he says with words like blessed, thankful, grateful. Now, again, I would not have a lot of, I would not have a lot of truck with some of the things that he believes theologically. But I appreciate the fact that he believes that he lives a life that is a gift and blessing from God. And so he lives a life of thanks, but also a life of giving. It is very easy for ex-presidents to live a life of ease, to settle into a simple routine of giving speeches both domestically and abroad, for obscene amounts of money, and to adopt the attitude of the Epicureans to just eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. And Mr. Carter has not done that. He has instead tried to find ways to serve humanity, very much like 
George Bush Sr. did in his years outside of the Oval Office. A life of thanks and a life of giving. Now, you and I may not do that in a dramatic way like that, as chronicled in the evening news or in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times. But the fact of the matter is that we are all called upon to live that kind of life. I mean, the Bible says that in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, we've talked several times from this pulpit about the fact that sometimes deciphering the will of God is a, is a challenge, and we've talked about that. There are certain things that we are planning to do in our life or we are contemplating doing and we are trying to navigate and know the will of God, and sometimes that's difficult to decipher, but sometimes God just says, look, I want you to understand, this is my will. And there are about seven or eight statements in the New Testament where God says this, this is the will of God for you, and this is one of them. In everything, give thanks, because this is the will of God for you. And so we might do well this Thursday as we enjoy Thanksgiving to maybe make it about a little bit more than just food and football and football and food, although those will be critical elements, I'm sure. Thanksgiving is a, a unique holiday in, in the true sense of the word. It, it is one and only one. It, it is a truly unique holiday. It doesn't celebrate, it doesn't celebrate a great battle. It doesn't celebrate a great victory. It doesn't celebrate the birthday of a famous individual. It doesn't, it doesn't celebrate a political milestone. It is simply a time to acknowledge that even the most common things, even the most mundane elements of our life, down to the very breath that we take during these minutes, is in fact a gift from the hands of God. The last time that I taught my Bible class on prayer. Fortuitously, when we got to the part on Thanksgiving, it was during this Thanksgiving season. And so I taught out of Psalm 116. And I said, you know, Thanksgiving really, this holiday ought to say three things to us. And I, could I just elaborate on that for just a minute tonight? And if you're taking notes at Psalm 116, maybe, maybe you just jot these three things down. Let me just mention them to you in passing. Number one, with Thanksgiving, we celebrate our dependence upon God. With Thanksgiving, we celebrate our dependence upon God. If the 4th of July is an expression and celebration of our independence as a nation, the Thanksgiving holiday in November is a celebration of the fact that we know that we are dependent upon God again for life and breath and all things. We are reminded that even the simple, daily things that we take for granted are really not to be taken for granted. Somebody has well said there are two classes of people, those who take things for granted and those who take things with gratitude. And I think there's a point to be made in that. And we want to be the people who take that with gratitude because we understand that every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights and there is no variation or shadow of turning. We may not always see that or appreciate that. We not, may not believe that everything comes to us has been filtered through the fingers of God, and yet that is exactly what James says. And so the psalmist would say, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and all that therein is. And so our God is consistent and compassionate. He doesn't occasionally just give us a crumb off his table and say, well, that should hold you for a little while. He's good to us, and he's good to us on a daily basis. And so maybe the Thanksgiving season is a wonderful time to disabuse our American minds of the illusion that, that we are ruggedly independent. And that whatever we have, it's because of our two hands and our intellect and our ability. And a good time to remember that we, we live as debtors to the grace of God. And this passage that we're looking at tonight, Psalm 116, verse 17, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now and in the presence of all of his people. And we have so much to be grateful for. I appreciated things that Joe enumerated in his prayer. You think about our religious blessings, public worship and praise and prayer, uncensored sermons, the fellowship of Christians, the opportunity to raise our kids in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And we can still do that in America unfettered. Even the Bible that you hold in your hand tonight. I mean, think about the number of Bibles that most of us possess. And then on our, on our phones or on our tablets, 
We have countless versions of the Bible that are available to us. Our worship tonight is not censored in any way whatsoever. And if you look at verse 7 and 8 in that passage, return to your rest, O my soul, because the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. In other words, he's saying, look, God has given us health and moral and spiritual insight and personal and family joys and even the hard things in life. You have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears. And what the psalmist is trying to say in that is that even in the difficult things of life, the thanksgiving that we can give is that we're not alone in that. That's what he said in the 23rd Psalm. Even when I traverse the valley of the shadow of death, You're with me. There's a sense in which we are all God's charity cases. Have you ever said in the course of your life, I don't want charity from anybody? I want to tell you, we all get charity from God. Charis is the word, by the way, from which we get our word grace. And without God's grace, we have absolutely nothing. And so it's a good thing that once a year, in the middle of all of about what's to transpire in the Christmas season, we pause to remind ourselves of our dependence upon God. Secondly tonight, we offer ourselves as a sacrifice to God. I want to show you three verses. I want you to look at them with me on the screen, and we're going to talk about each of them for just a quick second. Now, here's the first. Here's the first. The psalmist, he's not into theoretical issues. The psalmist never saw life as a think tank where spiritual people just sit around and debate what that might mean and how you might deal with that, and let's just think about the theoretical implications of that. He He doesn't operate that way. He deals in very practical matters. And so he says, what shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness toward me? And so thanksgiving, if God gives us good things, and what do we do in return to God? And that's his question. And he's going to give a couple of answers to that. And here's the first. The first one is, I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Now, I'll tell you that the bottom line of that, the point of that is, that service to our God is more than just, just giving a nod to God once, once a year during November, during a holiday. I, I want you to look <clears throat> at this phrase. He says, I, I'm going to lift up the cup of salvation. Now, you may have a marginal note somewhere in your Bible that Psalm 1, 113 through 118 are the section of Psalms called the Hallel. We get our word hallelujah from that. And the psalmist says, when he's talking about that, when he says, I'll lift up the cup of salvation, every Jew, every Hebrew would have understood lifting up the cup of salvation, referenced the Passover and taking the cup and what that represented about the liberation of their forefather Hebrews from their bondage in Egypt. If we were to make an application of that to 21st century Christians today, it would say, I'm going to lift up my understanding of from whom and from whence my salvation comes. I'm going to remember the price that was paid for my salvation. and the act of thanksgiving, I'll offer that cup of salvation and praise to God for what God has done for me in salvation. Simply put, there is no greater blessing you can have than salvation. What good is a long life if you don't have salvation? What good is a fortune without salvation? What good is a close family without salvation? To be without Christ is to be without hope. To be without hope is to be without a future. To be without a future is to be, as Paul would phrase it, without hope and dead in trespasses in our sins. And so he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be grateful for my salvation. And here's the second thing he says. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. And so he says, the second thing that I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to keep my promises to God. Now, when you read Psalm 116, we didn't take the time to read verses 1 through 6, but when you read 1 through 6, it becomes pretty clear that at a time of distress in his life, the psalmist made some promises to God. And most of us, if you've lived very long, you've probably done that. You've probably said, you know what, God, this is a bad time, and if you will do this for me, then I will do this for you. We probably all have done that at some point in time. And the psalmist just says, Okay, but are you going to keep what you promised God? Sometimes, you know, as time goes on, it's easy to forget what we promised. So could I ask you something tonight? Have you, could I just ask you tonight, have you, have you kept the promises you made to God? I think sometimes we make promises to God that we don't even think about. 
For example, do you, do you realize that when you were baptized, that whether you verbalized it or not, you, you kind of made some promises to God? You promised him that you were dying to an old way of life and that you were going to rise to walk in a new way of life. You made a promise to him that you were committing your life to him. That's what baptism is. How are you doing in keeping that, that promise to him? You, do you realize when you became a member of a local church, now, whether we verbalized it or not, when we became a member of a local church, we, in essence, made some promises to that community of believers. Now, we may not have verbalized it, but in essence, we were saying, look, I, I'm coming here to be a part. I'm coming here to be a brother in, or a sister. I'm, I'm coming here to be a, to be a part. I'm, I'm going to take responsibility for part of this work. I'm going to contribute financially to this work because that's what God expects me to do. I'm going to, I'm going to be a, a part of the harmony and peace in this congregation. I'm going to speak and think and act in such a way that peace will continue to prevail. I'm going to be an active participant in worship because I understand that worship is a verb. It is an action word. And so in essence, we promise all of those things when we become a member of a congregation like this. We all made vows when we got married. We stood before an assembly very much like this, composed of family and friends, as Abby will do, for example, tomorrow, and make vows, promises. And those, you know, they don't have an expiration date. God expects us to keep those, as we say in those vows, until one of us buries the other. When we brought kids into the world, we made that choice. They didn't make that choice. And so in essence, when we make that choice to bring children into the world, we in essence make some promises to God about that. That we're going to do what the Bible says. We're going to raise those kids in the whole training and admonition of the Lord. So we offer ourselves as a sacrifice to God. Sacrifice, by the way, before we leave this point that I just mentioned in passing, the sacrifice is used in two very distinct ways in the Bible. It talks about sometimes offering some thing. And so, for example, under the Levitical system, they would offer a animal sacrifice or an oil sacrifice or a grain sacrifice. They were offering something. But sometimes the word sacrifice is used to describe offering someone, ourselves. And that's why it's used in Romans 12 and beginning of verse 1, where Paul said, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, Acceptable to God. This is your spiritual service of worship. That is a life of thanks and giving. And then finally tonight, it will be finished. Third and finally tonight. I think Thanksgiving indicates that we're, we're, we're thankful for the people of God. This is a good time for us to stop and think about being grateful. Grateful for the people of God. Is your Bible still open to Psalm 116? I want you to read with me beginning in verse 14. And we're going to read, we're going to read four or five verses here. And I want you to pick out the verse in this reading that doesn't fit. That is, we're reading along. When we come to it and we read it, you think to yourself, what's that doing there? That doesn't make any sense. Look at verse 14. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all of his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am your servant. I, I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds, and so I offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. Which verse in that reading doesn't fit? That's yeah, right. It's verse 15. I mean, I, I've read that passage a thousand times, and, and every time I read it, it, it still doesn't fit. And so verse 14 says, I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am your servant. How in the world does that fit the context? Maybe the solution is what leads up to it. When he says, I will pay my vows to the Lord, and then this phrase, now in the presence of all of his people. And maybe what he's saying is that it's wonderful to rejoice in the death of saints. But part of paying our vows to God for what he's given us and blessed us with is to appreciate the people that he's put in our lives. Because once they die, it's too late to express that to them. We can gather as we do and offer a memorial service to them and 
speak eulogy, eulogy, good words about them, and that is right and proper. But maybe what he's saying is that one of the ways we pay our vows to God for the good things that he's given to us, the good people he's put in our life, is by thanking them now. So I want to encourage you to do that this Thanksgiving. To think about the people that God has brought into your life who make your life better because he put them there. You know, for me, that's, that's my wife, Vicki, and it's my children and my grandchildren. It's Carrie Keenan, Jonathan. It's the leadership team that I get to work here, with here. But it's my church family. It's, as I've said many times to you before, that you know, I've been blessed with mothers and fathers in the faith. And while I have told you before that I only have one sibling in this world, and honestly, I can't tell you if he is alive or dead, God has given me thousands and thousands of brothers and sisters that I've interacted with in this land. And then there are those special friends that we all have upon whom we can lean, and hopefully we can be a person that they can lean upon at times as well. And so maybe one of the most practical ways to celebrate Thanksgiving is to thank God for the people that he brought into our life who make a difference for good, and to do that before it's too late so that none of us ever have to say, I wish I had told them. When, um, when Abraham Lincoln spoke of a national day of thanksgiving, he made this famous phrase that has been often quoted. He said, we have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and strengthened us. We have vainly imagined all these blessings were produced by some superior virtue or wisdom of our own. Intoxicated by our unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity for redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God who made us, end quote. Somebody has well said that the hardest math to master is that which enables us to count our blessings. There may be some truth in that. But I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I think I'm talking to an audience tonight that wants to do that. And when all is said and done, we need to make sure that we thank God for God. As the psalmist would say in the 79th Psalm, so we, your people, and the sheep of your pasture, will give you thanks forever and show forth your praise to all generations. And I pray we'll do that. I pray we'll do that this Thursday. Take some time to do that. But I pray we'll also do that every single day. Thank you for listening so well tonight. How about you this evening? You know, how do you say thank you to God? Well, you do what God asks you to do. That's, that's what you do. And so maybe you're here tonight, you need to be baptized into Christ as we spoke a moment ago and make that commitment and speak those vows to God. Or maybe you need to come home to God. Gratitude is ingratitude does not look good on any of us but a grateful heart that leads us to obey our God, our Father, do what he asks, it looks good on everyone. And so if there's a public response you need to make tonight, we can help you. We hope you'll let us. Let's stand and let's sing.